Did he teach Nighthawk really how to play? Because their styles. Are I wouldn't be surprised. Robert Lee McCoy came to Chicago several times to record for Bluebird when Tampa Red was on Bluebird. He also recorded for DECA. But Lester Melrose would rehearse his artists at Tampa Red's house. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I guess, part of the inducement for an artist to record would be he got to meet Tampa Red and actually go to his house, you know. But I don't think that's the main reason he did it. It was just a convenient place. Uh, right around, right at near, uh, off the corner of 35th and State, I believe. And it was right next to a band, and some of the artists thought Lester Melrose owned the, ban the bank next door. <laughs> he wasn't that rich. Uh, I forget who it was told me that they worked on a chain on a, on a WPA gang with Lester Melrose, and I, I can imagine who didn't do an awful lot of work uh, was the gang leader. I don't know if that's true, but I think it was Big Joe Williams told me about that. On DECA, there was more mixing of, of jazz artists on blues records, especially in 1937 uh, or 38. James C. Petrello, who was then only the head of the local musicians union, he had a recording band in Chicago. So DECA moved all their recording, they just practically closed their studio here. He had a recording band because... There was a band for 18 months, 18 or why, 20 months. Why was that? He didn't like jukeboxes. He, he uh, To his credit, he fought the mob on the issue of jukeboxes. And the mob was more involved then than they have been probably at any time since. Hmm. Although they probably still involved a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't like records. And you couldn't, if you were a member of his, either of the two locals, the black local or the white local. I don't know that they had a yellow local. I don't think there was one. Uh, you could not record. So that's why RCA moved their recording uh, thing to Aurora, where they would enroll an artist. If they wanted to record him, they, they would put them in the Aurora local. But the blues and the country music recording was, was non-union that time, it was after the band was over, that the black local organized the black artists, after which the white local organized the hillbilly artists, and that was about the end of, but the whole whole epoch, that was the end of Chicago as a major recording center. It never never became that, that big again. DECA barely returned to Chicago. Uh, I think they'd come in once a year and clean the clean up the studios and do a few sessions. But that's when Mayo moved to New York and that's when you start getting Sidney Bechet and Tommy Ladner and the members of the John Kirby group, which was worked in a club around the corner from the Decca studio uh, on blues records. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes, uh, fatally, I mean, uh, I don't think Sleepy John ever recorded with Buster Bailey and Charlie Shavers. If so, they never issued it. But sometimes these guys, I, I remember it was a Petey Wheatstraw date in New York that wasn't, wasn't that great because <laughs> of the accompaniments not being into blues that much. So you've had Delmark now for almost 56 years, and, and mm. is it pretty equally divided between blues and jazz? Yes, it is. We, we passed the 800 mark in the 600 series. Uh, so that would be what, 800? 601 to 803, I think our last record was. So that's 800 blues records? No, no, it's, it's 203. The first one was 601. Okay. Speckled Red. So about so how many I blues records? So I the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to get a catalog. I might. So you have a couple hundred? A couple hundred blues. And in jazz, we are beginning to wonder what we're going to do because the 400 series, modern jazz, is approaching 600, which we can't repeat the numbers. Oh, so we'll probably go to a thousand. So we have almost 200 modern jazz, but we also have about 40 or 50 tr early jazz. Mm -hmm. So really, our uh, although Delmark's known as a blues label, we really have more jazz mm -hmm. album to album than we have blues. And you've recorded everything from ragtime to Dixieland rag to time, bebop to ragtime, trad, swing, uh, a very few big band masters we've acquired. Well, no, we recorded the Barrett Deems big band a couple mm -hmm. of times. Uh, 
it just I always dug all kinds. If you grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and you got interested in any kind of jazz, you quickly learned to love all of it. And especially if this happened in the 40s, when the hit parade, you know, Perry Como, the only man who made a million dollars in his sleep, or putting other people to sleep, <laughs> you know. And even Frankie Lane sounded pretty lame after a while. And he always had good sidemen on his early recordings. Matter of fact, Frankie Lane's first, first album on Mercury originally was a tribute to Louis Armstrong. And one of the tracks, Wrap Your Troubles and Dreams, was a hit. So they stopped putting the liner note with the tribute to Louis Armstrong on the, on the thing. It became purely Frankie Lane with no reference to any colored musician. How would you just how would you talk about different styles in the blues? People talk about blues well, as being you Yeah. Know. In the country blues you can sort of tell a guy from North Carolina, from a guy from Mississippi, from a guy from Texas. Uh, it's not that hard and fast, but it's it's a legitimate way to to look at it. Uh, and then there's a the different boogie woogie styles. You get your raggedy ass guys like Cripple Clarence Lofton and Speckled Red, and then you get your little more finesse people like Albert Ammons, uh, and How weird weird guys like Petey Wheatstraw. His piano is crazy. What about styles of blues guitar, elect electric styles of blues guitar? Well, there's, I don't know. You got side, and you got the other stuff. What do you define? Buddy the Guy is uh, well, like there's West Side. Right. You know, like. Buddy Guy and Otis Rush and Luther Allison, and then South Side is the mellow people like Wolf and Muddy and you know people like that. Uh, and of course, Wolf almost never played the South Side. Really, he was always at Silvio's at Lake mm -hmm. and Kedzie. Uh, almost always, or, or he had another gig on Roosevelt Road. And there, and Muddy was not always only on the south side. In fact, at one point, <coughs> Silvio had Wolf and Muddy, and if they were both in town, they both played there. And he said, "I got to hire two bands to make sure I always have one." Silvio was, I think, a very nice guy. The impression I get. When you would see Howlin' Wolf, did he often play guitar? Or was he mostly singing, playing harmonica? When I saw Wolf. Yeah, he, he usually played guitar. If, I think when he played harp, he may still have a guitar in front of right. him, but not touch it. I, right. I didn't pay that much attention to this. To, uh, I'd pay sometime more attention to sidemen than leaders, you know, right. in terms of what they're playing. Uh, now, the you, first several times <laughs> I saw Muddy, he wasn't playing guitar at all. He went for several years when he didn't play guitar. Yeah. When I got here in 58, I went to see him. And, He's not playing guitar. He was playing guitar. I saw him a couple of years ago at 13th and Ashland. He was playing guitar. And uh, he had to start playing guitar when he went to Europe. They didn't want him without mm -hmm. guitar. Didn't. And he went over the first year and they made him play acoustic. So he took an acoustic guitar the second time he went over. And in that year, the Brits had gotten hip to modern blues, and he, they had to go out and rent, they had to rent a, an electric guitar for him. Mm -hmm. But he never had any great feeling of being a great guitar player. And sure. of course, what he was was effective. He played effectively, it wasn't flashy. Right. You know, and, and the, the South Side guitar is, is not as popular with whites, in my experience as the stinging West Side, Magic right. Sam, Otis Rush, you know. Right, and <laughs> Hubert Sumlin, who's still, yeah. who's still playing, hopefully we're gonna be talking to very soon, because uh -huh. he's playing up at Space in Evanston oh, in Space. December. Oh, really a great club. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, it we, is. Uh, the, how, did Hubert catch your eye as, as Wolf's guitar player? Well, back when you like I say, him? I didn't listen to Sidemen that much, but both Muddy and Wolf had always had great guitar players and they basically they'd play second when he was up but you'd go into the club and Muddy wasn't up or Wolf wasn't singing yet and you'd hear a lot of good guitar and I wish I could remember the names of all the other mm -hmm. sidemen like Hubert gets 
credit he deserves. Right. And he is, turned out he was a pretty good singer. He is a pretty good singer. 